Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, if you could find yourselves a seat, get yourself some water, grab yourself some ice cream, find yourself a, a comfy seat. And it's, it's like the movies, you got yourself some ice cream, you got your drinks, you, you sat there and you're ready for the show. So we launched the big thing back in March. We're going to fast forward a few months to jump to today where we are launching the Business Innovation Program 2.0, BIP 2.0, a nice catchy short name for it, for a, for a smashing new project. So BIP 2.0 is the next generation of the very successful BIP 1.0, would you imagine? That's right, it was that successful, we've brought it back and we're going in for round two, which in turn replaced the original Business Innovation Support Initiative, which was very B-I-S-I -I busy. So we've rebranded to BIP and we're at the 2.0 stage. Um, each program has sought to build new value for territory businesses on what was available at the time. And here at the Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade, Martin and his team are absolutely focused on empowering small businesses and innovative thinking. So the development of the BIP 2.0 program follows deep stakeholder engagement on the review and evaluation of BIP 1.0. That's right, we went back, we asked, well not me, Martin and his team went back, asked the questions and reinvented it to make sure that it was relevant, up to date and had all of the, I guess, any kind of questions or queries that were around it to make it the best possible program it, it could be. And it continues to evolve. So here's to BIP 3.0 next year and I'll be back for that too, won't I? Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, the design and operation of the Enhanced 2.0 program um, comes from, like I mentioned, the feedback um, from clients of the program, advisors delivering the program, and investors looking to fund businesses coming out of the program. So it is a holistic journey. It's not just about the program itself. It's everyone who's involved and the impact that it has across the territory, because that's what we're about, is impacting all across the territory and making sure that as many people can be involved in the new innovation programs as possible. Uh, so BIP 2.0 is specifically designed to help startup founders and early, uh, early growth stage small businesses to commercialize their innovative ideas. So I've looked around the room and I've met a few of you before um, knowing of a few small business uh, innovation ideas. So I'm very, very excited to hear uh, what the brand new ideas are. And, and as a small business owner myself, I'm absolutely here for, for hearing all of those new ideas. And I'm so excited um, for the journeys that small businesses take here in the Territory, thanks to the support of great programs like this um, from great teams. Um, BIP 2.0 contains a number of new features to enhance the value that BIP 1.0 delivered. It's 2.0, it's the new and improved model. So let's check out some of the features. Um, a greater degree of choice for founders about who they engage with for advice as they progress through the program. So bringing on more, more people with, with a, a wider variety of skills to choose from. It's a great place to start. Um, a stronger focus on supporting commercialization than was in bit point one. Bigger and better. <laughs> Performance reward payments to the advisors to drive the best possible advice for founders going through the program and provide rewards for success. Con um, consumer it with efforts that advisors put into projects that they take, uh, they take on as clients. So obviously it's as much for the advisors as it is for the clients who are in, involved in the program. So we want to reward those and that expertise and that guidance and mentorship is, um, surrounding it. Um, and keep generating that great, fostering that great relationship that we have. Um, and greater diversity in the ecosystem. You are all part of our ecosystem online as well. Um, so we're, we're constantly expanding. I keep saying we. It's, it's the greater we, as in, as in Martin and his team, just for clarification. Um, more diversity, so making it bigger and better, growing it, it's more uh, accessible, uh, was it visibility? So we've got much more visibility of not only um, the advisors, uh, but the small business innovation team themselves and the investors. So you can connect in with so many people as the internet is a great place to do that. So the ecosystem, if you haven't checked it out, do so um, because we did go through it in the original launch and it's very easy to navigate and you can find exactly what it is that you're looking for. It's very user friendly. Um, recognizing the strong diversity in the needs of our innovators and that to build on that great work that's been achieved here in the Territory over the past few years, we need to reach out and collaborate with the broader innovation ecosystem across the country and our international region. So again, bigger and better. It's very exciting. And recognizing that diversity, it's important to note that all the new value BIP 2.0 offers. It will not suit everyone, but it does have that diversity and of course we're going through 
constant feedback loops to make sure that we can, you know, find solutions to things. So if you've got ideas and stuff, be innovative, have a, have a think about it, come and have a chat to the team as well. Um, Cause obviously we're wanting to make it as big and um, manageable for everyone. So it's great to remember that BIP 2.0 is not the only way that the Northern Territory government is supporting Territorians to innovate. The strategy 2.0 contains 16 initiatives to support innovation in the Territory. So if BIP 2.0 isn't what you need, contact the innovation team at innovation at nt.gov.au to find out what might be a better fit for you. But tonight is all about BIP 2.0. And before we, get, uh, before we do get into the nitty gritty, let's do some housekeeping. So in the case of emergency, follow Trish's directions. Trish, can you give us a wave? She's out there, there you go. She's, she's safely out there. Um, yeah, so Trish will be your go-to for that. Very knowledgeable. Um, and if you can't see Trish, you can follow Martin. <laughs> or myself, um, one of us will be up above in the crowd. <laughs> well, he'll be doing whatever Trish is doing and I'll be doing what he's doing. Um, well, there we go. <laughs> uh, toilets are just around the corner and we'll be having networking and refreshments after the briefing. So stick around and enjoy um, participating um, in our innovation territory ecosystem. Um, all the ice cream is gone. Yes. Fantastic. Awesome. So if you missed out, what a shame. Um, but we do have the ice cream miracle man at the back anyway. So maybe you can go and give him a, give him a nudge and see what he's got in the boot. So without further ado, let's bring up the, the man of the hour, um, Director of Business Innovation, Mr. Martin Redhead. Yes, round of applause, absolutely. You can, yeah, you can grab that one over there. Um, so with the Northern Territory Government, Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade, he's going to tell us a little bit about BIP 2.0 and have a Q&A session at the end of his presentation. So do keep note if you do have any questions, um, including online, make sure you pop them in the chat um, because we would love to be able to answer them. Um, but in general, you can always contact us via email as well to, to follow up any other questions. But you're here in person, so come and have a chat. Keep the questions in your mind and we'll have Q&A at the end. So. I'm going to stop talking for a moment and let Martin take over. G'day, Martin. Welcome. G'day, Danielle. <laughs> it's good to be here with you this afternoon and thank you for coming back and helping us out. With this My pleasure. This afternoon. Um, why BIP 2.0? Good place to start. Um, this here is the reason. Um, we're doing fabulous things uh, across the Territory in innovation. Um, we're looking at the investment in innovation from uh, across the country. Uh, during 2021, this is private sector investment. We've seen 50% of it, half of it go into, into New South Wales, a third of it go into Victoria, a quarter go into Queensland, and then a smattering across the rest of the states. 1% into Australian Capital Territory, 50 times more than went into the Northern Territory, right? We got 0.02% of private sector innovation into the stuff that you guys do day in and day out here in the Territory, and we need to do better than that. So as good as we've done, and we went through some wonderful achievements to date, we've got wonderful uh, uh, players in the ecosystem already. They're doing as much as they can do. Um, you guys need us to do more. So we went back to the drawing board, did what you guys do on a daily basis, reviewed what we're doing, had a look about how we can add new value, and we've come back with BIP 2.0. It's like BIP 1.0 does pretty much the same sort of thing. It just is intended to do it better. I'm not going to read out all these words. You guys can all read. I'm pretty confident. I've met most of you, and I think you're pretty good readers for your age group. <laughs> the client journey is important. Um, you have a bright idea. We're going to say, okay, first step first, go and do an online module of, of learning. Um, it's called IBAP. It's developed by the Australian Centre for Business Growth. They're world-class leaders in, in how to teach businesses how to grow fast. How, growing fast is a good way to go broke in business. You, some of you have probably done that before. Um, you, know, you start off small and you do your normal sort of things that you do, and then suddenly you get really successful, and suddenly your systems that you used to have don't work anymore, and you actually go out of business. The reason we're getting founders to do this stuff up front is because when you get down to here and of course you're going to get down to here because you're all very bright and you've got great ideas and you're going to 
get heaps of good support, you're going to scale really quickly. And so in the back of your mind all the time, we want you to be thinking about what that means and the things that you're going to have to do, not just the cool idea that you've got and making it and getting your MVP and talking to investors, but the actual hard work of growing a business really fast. So do your online modules. The other thing we want to get you to do is uh, have a look at the, the advisors and we'll look at all of this stuff in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but do some homework around the advisors that are on offer. And one of the things that Danielle mentioned was the greater diversity in the ecosystem. Um, previously, you know, government determined who you were going to go and talk to and if you didn't like them or if they didn't suit you or if you weren't in their, in their wheelhouse, then, well, bad luck. That's who government's paying to do the job. So this time round, we've decided to diversify that, recognising that, that the offerings that we do have were really good, but not necessarily suit, suiting everybody. So if you were in a, um, uh, trying to do something that didn't fit, didn't suit, bad luck. So we've, we've opened that up. So have a do some homework and, and really look at those advisors. Going through the, the uh, client journey, we'll, we'll skip through to um, each of those stages now. But that homework piece is really important. Innovation advisors are um, you know, people who can help you um, develop up your innovation through to commercialization. That's their jobs. Uh, they've got a million different ways of doing that. There's no one way to do innovation. Um, some ways work better than others, and some way will work better for you than they do for others. Um, so do your homework on those. Um, now, here's a thing. I don't have a, I don't have a mouse to click on this one, Carmel. I can't click on that. I was gonna flip over to our website and show you how to have a look at your advisors. Can we do that? Do I? All right, cool. So go there <laughs> and and have a look at who they are and, 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 and do your BIP modules. Go through, you'll get a $300 voucher to go and talk to your preferred advisor. That doesn't mean they're going to be your advisor. That just means you get a chance to talk to them and they're not out of pocket for talking to you because you might have a really cool idea that depends on an anti-gravity device or something and they don't actually want you as a client because they're not into anti-gravity devices um, or time machines or perpetual motion machines. But we don't want them wasting their time talking to you. But we do want them to talk to you because even if you're not for them, they might be able to give you some advice about how you can improve your idea, uh, concept going forward for the next round. Because you might not make it into stage one first up. You might have to go and work on your idea a bit further. But that's where those advisors, that first $300 is there to help you pay them so they're not out of pocket talking to you because your idea is crazy. And I think with that, Martin, it's also um, important to note that with the ecosystem and the way that it is, they've also got a, an opportunity to kind of um, connect in and find out a bit about you as well, don't they? Exactly, Danielle. That's a really good insight. And... Um, is this, is, this, is this the link that I was going to go to next? No? Have we got a... So the <laughs> your innovation, <laughs> your innovation project plan, the first stage, stage one, your advisor's job is to help you do two things. One is develop up your innovation project plan, and the second one is to develop your initial pre-traction pitch deck. Pre-traction because you don't have customers yet, so it's your, your dream uh, scenario of uh, how you're going to pitch this idea that you've got to investors or customers um, and the innovation project plan is how you're going to make that dream become a reality that you can demonstrate to those investors or, or those customers. Um, one of the important things about the project plan that you need to keep in mind is that you need to demonstrate how you're going to fully fund the project, um, the, the development project, getting to your minimum viable product. We'll give you some money potentially if you've got a good idea that fits our criteria. But part of this important thing is to cost out how much it's going to get you to get to MVP. Um, the pitch deck, of course, is going to help you find that money. You probably don't have it in your back pocket. If you did, you probably wouldn't be here tonight. Um, I don't, and that's why I'm here tonight, <laughs> other than I love this. Um, founders, important to remember, you're going to have 14 weeks. You've got to get... You've got to get in touch with an advisor and lock one in 14 weeks before assessments for funding fall. These dates, there's two dates each year, there's two rounds for funding, and you've got to have your round one, your stage one advisor locked in at least 14 weeks beforehand. If you don't, 
you'll have to wait till the next round because we don't believe you if you tell us that you're going to get your project plan and your pitch deck sorted in less than 14 weeks. So figure out what dates those are, count back 14 weeks prior to that, make sure you've got your stage one advisor locked in before that. So where can we find those dates? That's a, that's a brilliant question. I'm going to have a link shortly that I'm going to click on. Fantastic. That I'll bring that up. So in theory, all the information that you'll need is on the website. It is. It is. And the first date, Carmel, yelling out from the back, is going to be in November. Stay, yeah, first, first assessments for, for the first is in, is in November. And yes, those dates precisely will be up on the website if they're not already very shortly. So to do the homework on the, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten the name. On the, on the computer. On the, well, yes, on, on the, the computer. On the, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> on the on advisors. The on the advisors. On the advisors. So the advisors are on the, I know we're going to get to that, but the advisors are on the website. You can start doing your homework today. You can. Yes. I would, if I was you, because you're only going to have four weeks, five weeks, five weeks from tonight to lock them in. Lock them in if you want to be in round one. So get chatting. Start talking. There is a few in the room tonight. It's Important thing for the advisors and for you to remember is that going through the program and attracting further support, one of the really key uh, concepts is demonstrating value for the territory. Value for the territory is a concept drawn from our procurement framework, uh, and, it, and it is what it sounds like, that your project has to demonstrate value for the territory. One of the big ones we love is jobs. If you can show how your innovation will grow jobs in the territory, we love that and we're going to jump all over it. But there's heaps of other things that you can look at. Um, we're going to assume right now that your advisor is really good and you're really clever and that your innovation is desirable, feasible, viable, investable, sustainable. Um, if that's the case and all the applications that we receive for stage two support are those things, then the ones that win will be value for the territory. If they're not these things, they're not going to go forward. If they are all those things, then the ones that deliver the most value for the territory will be funded first and we'll go down the list we're running out of money. We're thinking we'll run out of money in about five projects. So it's pretty competitive mm -hmm. and it's not a great deal of money that we've got on offer. But the value that this process, from our experience in supporting territory businesses to do innovation, this process of developing your pitch deck early, figuring out what your, your scalability vector is and how you're going to achieve it, will put you in a really strong position where this amount of money is useful, will get you where you need to go, but you will be in a really great position to go and see the Paspalis Innovation Investment Fund or or one of those other VC funds around the place and get support from them. So stage one in and of itself delivers a huge amount of value um, for, our, for, our, uh, for our founders and innovators. Getting into stage two, you get the support from a stage two advisor, but you must make sure that you get the quote for the stage two advisor in your project plan during stage one, because we're going to be assessing what you're doing with your money. Martin, does the stage two advisor have to be the same person as the stage one advisor? It doesn't, Danielle. You can change horses at, mid, at, at stage change. Um, you can stick with the same advisor if you like to. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll circle back to some expectations we've, we've asked of advisors when they've applied to be on the pre-approved list. And one of them is to support you if you do Say you're doing a gizmo, right? And your innovation's a gizmo and, and you've worked with stage one advisor because they're really good at pitch decks and project plans. But what you really want to do is in stage two, work with that advisor who's excellent and specialist on gizmos. And part of your stage one was identifying that person. You didn't know about them before, but now you go, ah, oh, I really need that gizmo advisor. Well, a stage one advisor should be saying, that's great. That's a perfect idea. I'll lose you as a client through stage two. But my job as your advisor during stage one is to help you get in a position to be in the right with the with the right people in stage two. Um, and you can use as a founder up to forty percent of your thirty k. That's twelve twelve thousand um, dollars to pay for your stage two advisors. And and the advisors all charge different different amounts, as we'll see when we go through them shortly. 
Um, and then they get paid at the at the end of the after having delivered the services. So value for the territory. We're talking about this whole range of things. Um, yeah, jobs, jobs. It's down here. It's actually number one. But any of these things are, are all considered value for the territory. And you can use your imagination even further on those. Um, We'll provide further further advice and links on the website as to how you can get to understand value for the territory, but it is actually a pretty simple concept, and it is what it sounds like. Um, in stage two development, what are we developing? You're developing your minimum viable product. Hands up, everyone who knows what a minimum viable product is. Hooray! Yes, hooray! <laughs> um, so that's what. If you don't know, that's going to be part of your homework and part of what you figure out in stage one. So I'm not going to explain it tonight. Um, but that's what you will be developing in stage. Okay, I'll tell you, it's it's what you prototype. It's 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 the, the thing that can demonstrate to yes to to customers or investors that this is worth spending money on. Um, now, you, for your stage two funding, you're going to have up to twelve months to to spend it. Hopefully, it doesn't take you that long. Um, but after that, if you haven't expended your funding, your your advisor doesn't get paid. So your advisor's going to be on your case and they're going to be pushing you to get your MVP prepared within 12 months because they definitely want to get paid. Um, so be prepared for that when you enter into that relationship. Um, this is taxpayer money. We do need to report on it. We do need to be accountable and transparent and all those things. Otherwise, ICAC gets upset and goes, you know, you just guys are funding nothing. Commercialization. Access to support, commercialise your innovation and maximise your investment opportunities. What does that mean? Well, for example... The Digital Partnerships Program um, does those things. And in round one of DPP, we supported five projects. We actually supported six. One fell over due to COVID, um, and one has been delayed and is still in progress. Um, that's a really exciting one, the Digital Technology to so Showcase Aboriginal uh, uh, Sites, Heritage and Landscapes with 3D VR headsets, really interactive. Um, you know, uh, Virtual uh, avatars of, of elders, and we acknowledged elders and, and, and the owner, traditional owners of the country that we're on um, here. Um, this allowed people from wherever they are in the world to engage with those traditional owners and understand more about the country, the culture, um, the language, all of those, uh, the art and, 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 and cultural, cultural expression. But really good. So looking forward to that one uh, commercialising in due course. It's been a bit delayed. These other four are cracking on as, as really wonderful, wonderful projects. That's the sort of space that BIP, when you get to stage three, you're in a good, good position to get into a program like that. And what I would like to say now is that we've just um, completed the assessment for the second round of, of DPP funding and I'm delighted to announce tonight to you all the winners of that funding, the, the successful proponents. Um, they are Playground 123, uh, which has got a digitalised asset inspection, compliance and management software for, for an application for um, initially playgrounds. Um, but it's entirely scalable to all sorts of assets. And, and what it does is take the paperwork. A lot of these systems use really old-fashioned ways of checking things up and you tick a box and you tie a thing to a pigeon's leg and send it over to the government. This makes all of that really quickly, uh, much quicker and easier. Sterling NT Micor um, is the second winner, have, and we might hear from uh, hear from uh, from uh, Bob at Playground One Two Three. He's out at Large Mano at the moment, so we've got a pre-record. Huge thank you to Martin and the team at the Territory Business Innovation Stage Two. Uh, it's a great opportunity for Playground One Two Three to have access to this grant, and we're pretty proud and honoured to be the recipient. This grant enables Playground 123 to hit the commercialisation stage of, pro of our project running. Uh, these funds not only enable to us now to go into full development mode, but also play a bit more of a focus on our customers, which Playground 123 is a unique product. However, our focus is keeping the customers happy and providing a product that is usable, functional and delivers is critical. We've already got people on the order list waiting and monies have been put into budgets for certain councils ready for the product to roll out so once again i'd just like to say thanks martin and to the team at territory business innovation this is a fantastic opportunity and we're hoping 
that this can bring forward our production or our commercialisation by at least 12 months. So we're hopefully we're rolling out at Christmas time. Look forward to seeing you at the next update. Thank you. PIP 1.0 didn't get Bob and Playground 123 to commercialisation. It got them into the position where they are able to access support like the Digital Partnerships Program, which brings them right there to to commercialisation. They have customers. They're customer ready. They've been really customer focused the whole way through. Um, and that's one of the things that's different about BIP 2.0 is that we're focusing on that commercialisation right from the start with, with IBAP. Secondly, we've got Sterling. In tea with Michael, and tonight in live in person, we have Kamal. And Kamal, could I invite you up to say a couple of things about your progression through the through the various programs? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I normally hate getting up and speaking in front of people, but when someone gives you money, you have to do that. Um, <laughs> look, uh, thank you very much. It's been uh, a privilege to be um, selected for this, and thank you very much for. The amazing work you guys have done, Man, Carmel, thank you. Um, our project, we, as you saw earlier, we went through the first round. We had an idea that we wanted to um, make work, and it took many, many different iterations to get to an MVP. And once we finally got to that outcome, and we had some really good clients waiting to receive a product. We went through th uh, a global chip shortage and we went through multiple iterations of changing that product over. And uh, now we're finally in a position to get that uh, product in the hands of our clients and this grant helps us change our user interface so that the good people at Defense can also use this product. And um, they've got lots and lots of fields and open areas that they'd like to save some water on. So we're really excited about what this means for us and what we can do here and what we can build in the territory mo most of all. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Kamal. So again, really, really strong focus on, on clients, um, delivering what people need, not just what I think is a good idea. I think I've said it before, I have great ideas all the time. Uh, no one cares. Uh, they're only great if someone else wants to pay for them and that's what BIP's about getting into that position where you can develop up uh, that sort of a product that, that, that someone else is willing to part with good money for. Um, where else can you go? So DPP is an example of a government uh, program that BIP will get you ready for. Other examples are this, the Northwestern Australia and Northern Territory, the Drought Resilience Adoption and Innovation Hub. Um, fabulous, fabulous uh, new addition to the Territory ecosystem and if we can just press play on that one. G'day, my name is Andrew Dowdleish. I'm an organic mango and asparagus farmer from Catherine. As a farmer, I always need to be prepared for drought and climatic extremes. That just comes with farming in the north. As an industry, we have developed our knowledge and farming practices to help us to grow and build a life in this special region. But more needs to be done. As the effects of climate change increase and the global demand for agriculture product rises, we need to be smarter about how we farm. A drought and innovation hub will transform the way producers and communities farm and prepare for drought. A hub in Darwin with nodes across the region will make it easier for producers to access technology and the resources to innovate and enhance our bottom line. Producers from the region look forward to engaging with the hub and building our knowledge to become more productive and resilient for our future. Importantly, the hub will develop and promote sustainability practices for the benefit of our communities and the environment. A drought resilient adoption and innovation hub will drive the future of agriculture and help to revitalise our regional communities in the north. The north is the future of agriculture in Australia. This hub will be the catalyst for its growth and development. Danielle, that's an example of the diversity that, that, that's a really blossoming here in the, the Northern Territory uh, innovation ecosystem. So you're going through BIP, um, your advisors, you, you know, you're working on a, on a bit of ag tech um, or some food food production innovation. Um, obviously, this is the, the place, one of the places where you can you can end up pretty successfully and supported. They've got a fund behind them. Um, 
uh, another example uh, just coming online, just announced. Um, Vanya, when was this announced? Uh, last week. Are you right to jump up and tell us a bit about it? Sure. And this, this bit of kid here? So coming up to the microphone, we've got Vanya. And, and this, is, this is entirely unscripted. So look, thank you, Vanya. Just if you can give us a couple of minutes and tell us about where, where a BIP 2.0 client might come through and find themselves engaging with you guys. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So the test lab at CDU, which is called the North Australia, sorry, the CDR MIT Industry 4.0 test lab, is, for, is really to enhance manufacturing uh, in the Northern Territory, particularly around drone technology or, or uncrewed aircrafts. So what the hub is really about is bringing different small to medium-sized enterprises together with researchers, with academics, and also with investors, and to create a small ecosystem to be able to bounce ideas, create new ideas, and push advanced manufacturing of drone technology in the Northern Territory. So, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Brand new addition. So this is where your, your pitch deck, et cetera, that you developed and your project plan right back at the start, you know, really, really is delivering a lot of value for you and how you're going to figure out how you're going to engage with the CDU RMIT Industry 4.0 test lab. And Vanya mentioned uh, uh, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, another uh, space in the territory that you might end up you know, coming through BIP 2.0. Um, is, is with a, the Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre. And I'll call on Charmaine to come up and, and just talk through the next couple of slides, please. Charmaine's the Director of the Northern Territory Advanced Manufacturing Growth Centre. And this is another wonderful addition to the Territory ecosystem in the last 12 months. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think as soon as people say manufacturing, they switch off because there's a perception out there that there is no manufacturing here in the Territory. So uh, this is why I am here and this is the clarity, I guess, around ad what advanced manufacturing is and what it can mean for the Territory. So manufacturing is actually a capability. It is not a sector. It goes across all sectors, so drones, agricultural, um, anything you'd, that is being made is manufacturing. So traditionally, um, people think that production and end product, that is manufacturing. We know we can't compete in um, that end product. So we, as AMGC, start looking at these value add areas. Where, we, where can we support businesses in the R&D stage, in the design and logistics, and even in the servitization? We know that the territory is very big on a service supply area. So how can you design systems to do predictive maintenance or start using the data that's gathered to develop programs to support your clients and delivery times, etc. as long as you're not using trucks, because they take forever. Um, so our aim here in the Territory is to grow manufacturing. So we encourage a deeper collaboration between industry and research partners. So we do have a good relationship with CDU and the Industry Test Lab and connecting with them. Um, we look at the ecosystem as working together. So we support businesses that identify other collaboration partners within the, in the Territory because we know it's hard to do it your, on your own and you can access a bigger market if you collaborate. So it's building a lot of more strength in our manufacturing industry here in the Territory. And we're promoting the development of advanced skills. So we are a five-year program. Uh, we're working with business, businesses that could potentially come out of this program and over the next five years, where do you want to be? Do you want to um, access a broader market getting into exports or even looking locally and redesigning and developing the, the products that you have? So this is the sectors that I cover. <laughs> so pretty much everywhere if you haven't seen me around, because as I said, advanced manufacturing does go across all sections. And this is what advanced manufacturing is. So everyone gets scared of the term industry 4.0 and what that is. And simply, it's just the adoption of technologies, improving your processes. If you are doing things with paper and tying them to a pigeon's leg and sending them off, how can you start looking at that and developing systems that make it easier for you to work within your business? Um, using different composites, if you are in the manufacturing facility, 
um, augmented reality and virtual reality, so what um, Martin touched on before, so development of those that transform and bring the territory forward or even in line with um, interstate companies. This is all um, classified as advanced manufacturing and this is where we can potentially support you. So how can we support you? Um, going on from this particular program that we do have uh, seven and a half million dollars to invest in advanced manufacturing technologies across the territory. Um, very particular to say across the territory because we've got really good innovations down the track. I do um, regional visits every quarter and I think I've already got applications in there from down in Alice Springs and Catherine which is really promising. So. Seven and a half million to invest over the next five years, and this is to support projects where the main project activity is here. So if you need to collaborate with an interstate um, business to introduce the technology here in the Territory, that's supported as long as the main project activity occurs here and you've got another NT collaboration partner. It's all about transfer of knowledge, transfer of skill, and building that longevity and that resilience into your business so we can build up our manufacturing sector here again. And there's no close date, so it's um, open until funds are exhausted. I'm hoping to invest them fairly quickly, put a big case forward to say that manufacturers are eating this money up. Um, so work on those innovations, get them through the program, and come see me if you're in that list of um, categories that you saw earlier. Thank you, Charmaine. Charmaine's an example of a subject matter expert also within the ecosystem and we might, if we get, ch get a chance, uh, have a look at that. But um, So the different, different uh, entities, people, organisations play a range of different roles in the ecosystem and so what we're looking at with the, with the AMGC is a subject matter expert as well as a potential landing pad for you guys coming out from BIP uh, 2.0. And uh, look, I'll just call Charlie Ill up to the microphone please, Charlie, uh, Executive Director of Investment Solutions. So this is where you've gone through this process, you are now um, cracking on and in that real steep growth curve, and then you'll go and talk to Charlie. Thanks, Martin. Um, can I have a click? Yeah, thanks. Uh, shake hands too. Um, so I guess Local Jobs Fund is the stage after AMGC uh, and potentially some of the other uh, local financing groups that are available. But essentially our role is to help bridge that gap, that valley of death that all startups uh, feel the pain of where you're making net losses until you start onboarding customers and become more net profit positive. So essentially we're helping to bridge that gap and allow you to scale up. Um, and so that's kind of where we sit. I mean, you have AMGC here that uh, provides a lot of support from an R&D standpoint and about realizing that first product. Once you've gained that first customer, that's when we, we come in and get involved. And that, so that's the overlap there. Paspalis as well is another one. Um, Paspalis and us, again, we overlap on some deals, some of the larger deals, but Paspalis oftentimes will come in slightly earlier than us in other deals. Um, so we're that stage that's after some of those other levels as well. Um, in terms of what we offer, it's both equity and debt. So kind of unique to us is, and because of the role as government, we're willing to t onboard a bit more risk, which would be related to that debt play, not necessarily always sharing in the upside of your businesses. Um, certainly feeling the pain and the downside and on, both, uh, on both sides, but it is both equity and as well as debt related projects. And the other thing that's unique to us is we offer both the type of loan where the outcome is generating jobs, which it matters to us, but also we can offer a type of uh, product which is just about infrastructure. So let's say you want a warehouse, a hangar, doesn't create any additional jobs. In certain other product categories, you won't qualify for us, you do qualify for that, which is more that creation of infrastructure. That's it. Fabulous. Thanks, Joe. Sure. So, so it's all about the ecosystem and, and, and BIP 2.0, as, as Danielle said, might not be the right fit for you at whatever stage of your journey you're on, um, but we are right there at the very start. So that's where getting your concept right, getting your pitch deck together, getting your plan for how you're going to get your MVP together, getting, the, getting yourself into a position where you can then go on to talk to other people, whether it's the Paspali Investment Fund or, or AMGC or, or the Durant Resilience Hub, 
um, and eventually LJF and, and other larger scale investors. But I think it's also important to note, Martin, that events like this and being a part of the ecosystem um, as well is a great opportunity for you to go and have these conversations live in person with those you may not have met otherwise. So even just being in the same room like we are today is a, is a great opportunity. And I mean, we will be networking at the end of this as well. So make sure that you've got a, you've got a business card or a, or a handshake or something ready to go. All right. So fabulous. I, here's another one of those links. We're going to click on this one. It's innovation.nt.gov.au. This is going to be a new favorite website after tonight. I'm pretty sure. So, oh, we've gone straight to advice. If we can go back up to, back up to the homepage, maybe that'd be a good place to start. Um, so you've landed on your homepage, you scroll down until you find the innovation ecosystem. Here's a whole bunch of things you might want to look at, it depends on what you're looking at, but you're going to BIP 2.0 and you're looking for an advisor. So you go to the advice button and click on that. It comes up with all sorts of advisors. We've got business innovation program, that's the one you're after. We've also got mentors and subject matter experts. And if we click on subject matter expert, just very briefly, You'll see these people come up and they'll go, oh, advanced manufacturing expertise. I wonder what that's about. If we click on that, so this is by subject matter because you're looking for subject matter experts. And here we have Charmaine Phillips and her phone number and her email. So you want to talk about, there you go, you just found a subject matter expert on that. So going back and we click off subject matter expert and click on business innovation program because that's actually what we want to do. And here we have the list of currently pre-approved advisors. So these are the people that you'd be doing your homework on over the next four or five weeks, deciding which one you'd like to go for. Um, the process was we put out a call for expressions of interest. A range of entities came back and put their hand up. We did due diligence on them. We did an assessment of their uh, previous performance um, and how they demonstrated that, um, what their methodology is, does it make sense, um, are they cowboys or not. None of these here are, in my opinion, and I'm the one who <laughs> passed them through the process, are cowboys. They've all got strong track records. Um, they've demonstrated the best interests of their clients as, at all times, um, as far as I can um, determine. So uh, what happens when we click on one of these? Let's click on who's not here tonight. Hmm, they might be on online. Let's... <laughs> Let's click on Jamie Toyne and see what we've got under the Jamie Toyne tile. So, Jamie Toyne. Developed an international consulting firm headquartered in San Francisco. Um, moved back to Alice Springs and has worked with DKA, working with uh, Central Australian startups to develop their products, special interests, stage one services. He's going to give you a pitch here about what he's what he's going to do for you in stage one. Um, we'll scroll down. So he's not sure what's happening there because that shouldn't be the end of the tile. Um, hmm. and there's a YouTube link there to watch. Well, that might get out of that one because it doesn't seem to be working. I don't know whether it's the interface here tonight or not. But um, uh, who else we got? DNA, Doug Adamson. Oh, there's a picture of Doug and again there's something going funny with the interface tonight there's all this text there that's just cutting off he's got his his price list down there at the bottom and so on and so forth so you can do that research yourself figure out whether it's Doug or Jamie there's a whole range of them there so that's how that works so we might just jump back to the out of the website and back to the Prezo so just a question on that one there, Martin. Yep. Um, it's got their contact details there. Yes. Are you wanting them to contact them directly that way or do we go through you? I, I think it would be much more expeditious for you to contact them directly, Fantastic. Daniel, and uh, have, that, have that conversation rather than government getting in the way of your relationship with your, with your advisor, which is a very particular and special relationship and one that you have to think about very carefully. So you can start those conversations once you've had a read through and go forth just one thing i might do is while we're here if we can click back to that and just go to resources um i talked about ibap as being part of your pro homework on, uh, during the uh, the um enrollment stage hopefully you'll get enough of a vision out of this it, on your computer it will look completely different you can look at it on your mobile phone you'll actually see all of the pages i promise i don't know why it's doing it tonight but we've got probably one too many things going we're live streaming we're recording we're 
got all sorts of got Q&As online, so it's happy days. Um, in the meantime, once we get that, just click it anytime it's coming. There we go. So if we scroll down a little bit to resources, um, and there here we have uh, the immediate business acceleration program. So then if we click again, because this is government, we can't make you click too many links in a day. We go to this page here, which is a very exciting nt.gov.au page. Um, and if we click on topic one, your business model and how do you make money? And we go down and there's a PDF or a doc, word doc, depending on your preference, of finding the money you need to grow your company. Here then we have Dr. Jenner. I think many of you may have be aware of Dr. Jenner, if not met with her or studied with her. She's a world leading expert in, in business growth. Um, and she'll, she'll give you a little tutorial there about the sort of things you need to be thinking about. And then she's got uh, talking with uh, Territory uh, CEO Dan Richards from Humpty Doo Barabundi about um, using the business model tool to analyze your business and identify how you can make money. And if we keep scrolling, there's topic two, finding the money. Topic three, understanding the difference between marketing and sales, who your ideal customers are, assessing risks and opportunities. The sort of things you're going to be thinking about when your innovation starts to scale really quickly. And you need to have thought about that stuff from the start. All right, so we'll just click out of that and go back to the to the Prezo. Um, here we go. The approved advisors. Larrikin Interactive. Um, do we have a video from Larrikin Interactive to play? <sighs> Dylan. Dylan. Dylan suffered a medical emergency during the week and was unable to repair his video in time. So here we have some... some yeah, profile some some very summary profile remember go back to resources and click on his link you'll find out a lot more about him the point about Dylan is that he's an expert in uh, video games gamification commercialization and the recent launch um, uh, last week of the week before two weeks of the what's it called Dylan think desert race and uh, if we had a bit more time, we could bring up a, a, a YouTube clip of that running, but we don't have time. Carmel's going to stab me with her pencil if I keep wasting time. Jamie Toyne. Jamie also didn't have an opportunity. He's very busy supporting some clients down there in Central Australia. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're in Central Australia, um, uh, Jamie also specialises in, in supporting um, a whole range of... Um, of businesses through Desert Knowledge Australia and he just did the Aboriginal Business Accelerator program with DKA which supported six Aboriginal businesses to um, progress their, their business development journey very quickly. Um, so, you know, there's some, some background to, to Jamie and his um, Deloitte Touche Tomates who has a star which means that they've got a video. Let's, let's play a video. Australia's just not good at innovation, right? Actually, that's not right. We've got a long and proud track record in invention, a brilliant science and research reputation, strong government support, and pretty compelling motivation to keep improving. We're actually great at innovation. What we're not so great at is commercialization, turning all that research into development, ah, into do. So I think Australian business has been quite slow off the mark in terms of the current wave of innovation. And what we're trying to do is get Australian business to think about, to embrace innovation, not just product innovation, but to go beyond that into business model, into platform innovation, and really get ahead of the game. So what's the solution? We need to prioritise outcomes over analysis. We have to get from what if we could to here's how we can. Turn concepts into commercials, ideas into industries. What does it take? Skills, speed and discipline. That's what makes Deloitte's approach to innovation in your business different. We can do it for you because we've done it for ourselves. One of the reasons that innovation works so effectively at Deloitte is that we've moved from having a separate innovation strategy to embed innovation right into the core business strategy. The 
Deloitte strategy is around new business models, customer service uh, and business transformation and innovation is absolutely core to that. And what I love about this particular case study is we work with the client from the very initial inception of what the idea was all the way through to delivery of a fully functioning business. Um, and what's phenomenal is we did that in just 10 weeks. I've lost count of the number of clients I speak to who have a backlog of great ideas and they just can't execute quickly enough. Strategy, design and capability build. These are the three components of our innovation offering and they're a direct response to the needs that we hear from our clients. So I think the opportunity is really exciting for Australian business and government. You know, we should be bringing those innovations from overseas, making them Australian, but also focusing on our own R&D so that we are innovating in you know, everything that we're doing business in government so that we keep our competitive edge as a country. So if you're looking for more from your innovation program, more experience in delivery, more speed in execution, more successful outcomes, then let's turn R into do together. You want to jump on the microphone, Martin? <laughs> I know you're all very grateful. <laughs> um, yeah, so start up on ramp. Uh, it's a, st a starred uh, ad advisor, which means we've got a video. Hi, I'm Colin. I'm an experienced startup coach, and I have a focus on helping entrepreneurs to build globally scalable companies. Over the last 20 years, I've worked with over a thousand startup founders. I've been an early stage investor. I've run startup incubators and accelerators. I've helped Aussie founders to learn from experienced entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And I've been a mentor, a coach, and an advisor to a lot of successful companies. I'm also the founder and CEO of Startup OnRamp. We're Australia's leading online startup incubator. Over the last five years, we've helped over 1,500 startup founders to start and grow technology companies by learning from the experiences of successful founders. As an innovation advisor, I'd love to work with you on your startup idea. Uh, the first step will be to help you test and validate your idea with customers and then build a minimum viable product and go from there to launching the product and getting your first paying customers. I've worked with a lot of successful startups and if I work with you as an advisor, I'll be focused on helping you to figure out what actions you should spend your time on early on that are going to make the biggest difference on the success of your startup. I've also seen plenty of mistakes made by first-time startup founders, and in fact, I reckon I've seen just about every way there is possible to fail in a startup. Uh, the good news is that a lot of these mistakes are predictable and avoidable. So if I'm working with you as an advisor, I'll be aiming to make sure that you can avoid making the mistakes that cause a lot of other startups to fail. For stage one applicants, what I provide is a package of individual coaching to help you get your startup underway. Uh, some of the things I can help you with are testing and validating your ideas with customers to make sure you're building something that they actually want, uh, developing and refining your business model, and exploring options for funding your company. If you work with me, you'll also get access to the Startup on Ramp Founders course. Uh, this is an online course that builds your knowledge of essential startup concepts. It features case studies with a whole bunch of experienced founders, investors, and other experts. And the course has already been completed by over a thousand entrepreneurs from all around Australia. For stage two applicants, what I can provide is a package of individual coaching aimed at getting you from an MVP to a scalable business. Some of the things I can help you with are how to develop your product, your business model, your customer acquisition strategy, and the brand for your business. Uh, I can also advise on launching your product and getting your first customers, uh, building the right team, creating a compelling investor pitch, and how to raise money from investors. If you're accepted into stage two, you'll also get to take part in the Startup on Ramp Pre-Accelerator. Uh, the Pre-Accelerator is an online incubator program that I designed specifically for entrepreneurs who've been working on their startup idea for a while. 
By doing the pre-accelerator, you can work on growing your business as part of a cohort of like-minded founders. And while you're doing that, get guidance from some of Australia's most experienced startup mentors. If you've got any questions, feel free to get in touch. Otherwise, I'll really look forward to working with you. Martin. Give it another go. <laughs> the Darwin Innovation Hub was first founded in 2017 and has since developed and grown businesses in the Northern Territory, becoming the Territory's leading innovation hub. Since 2019, our sister company and resident venture capital fund, the Paspalis Innovation Investment Fund, has directly invested $10 million of venture capital into businesses which provide an economic benefit to the Territory, creating lasting impact for the communities in which we live. We have pioneered a consulting-based approach to venture capital, partnering closely with investors and management teams to offer the insights that challenge conventional thinking, build great businesses and improve operations. The Darwin Innovation Hub provides expert advice to established businesses, entrepreneurs and startups, adding value into the innovation and investment ecosystems of the Territory across a multitude of sectors. Start NT is our in-house program designed and tested by startups for startups. StartNT provides a life cycle commercialization pathway for companies looking to scale and become investment ready in the Northern Territory. This life cycle support begins at ideation and ends at exit. Investigation is where we work with you to define your value proposition and assumptions, creating a competitor and market analysis. Then, we validate these assumptions and begin to test the market. You create a business plan and set your budgets, legal and financial structures. At this point, you can apply for funding with grant bodies, investors or self-fund to the next stage. Once you have your business plan and legal structures, you will start developing the product or service, your product roadmap, partnerships and your go-to-market strategy. From here, you will grow and use your learnings, identify new funding sources, and continue to scale your team, the offering, and your client base. If you take on investors, then their exit needs to be planned. When and how will they receive their return? All of this takes time, and we will be with you the whole way through. If you are a startup, an established business, a consortium, or a research spin-out, you are the right fit for Start NT. Visit www.darwininnovationhub.com.au for more information, case studies and feedback from our ambassadors. We look forward to helping you commercialise and start up in the NT. Leap Sheep, uh, specialising in tech startups, um, digital, they've... Uh, uh, Looking at to specialise in pitch development, pitch assessment, recruitment, training staff, and building networks. Um, and the next uh, video we've got is Rust 490. Hello, I'm Jude Ellen. I'm an ideas activator and a strategic business analyst. And I'm delighted to be an advisor under the Business Innovation Program version 3.0. I'm also an economist trained in public health, and trained in management, and I'm a connector, a facilitator, and I'm a businesswoman. I delight in finding ways to bring concepts to fruition in business. That's at the core of my professional work. I'm experienced in diverse methods, tools, and approaches to find a viable business proposition and business model with discipline, efficiency, and flexibility. And the territory is my backyard, it has been for almost 30 years. The bedrocks of my journey are walking with First Nations people in two-way dialogue, the sustainability of our land and our environments, and my complete delight in the endlessly surprising cultural diversity and creativity of Territory people. 
I'm deeply familiar with the Northern Territory innovation ecosystem from different perspectives. Firstly, I've done the commercialisation journey from the Territory. I co-founded a tech IP startup in Darwin in 2002, undertaking commercialisation with federal government program funding, eventually selling IP into global software markets and transforming the company into a sustainable consultancy business lasting some 15 years. Somewhere in the middle of running the consultancy company, I opened a small co-work entrepreneurial hub in Darwin in 2014. I helped catalyse community and sector-specific ideas hackathons. I helped bring GovHack to the Territory for the first time and Techstars. I was a member of the Northern Territory Government's Ministerial Digital and IT Advisory Committee for some years. And through partnering and collaboration, I grappled with ways to bring support to entrepreneurs and people with ideas in a small innovation ecosystem. Darwin Innovation Hub, the government, information technology comms and creative industries, business more broadly, investors, clusters, members of parliament, territory and national, they're all part of the partnering mix. In doing so, I learnt much about different models, approaches to qualifying in concepts and finding a commercialisation roadmap. So where do I fit now? I'm the founder of Rust 490, originating as the 2014 co-work entrepreneurial hub space. Rust 490 as a business has reformed after the disruptive catalytic COVID years, now offering specialist consulting services and advisory support for entrepreneurs. Ideas flourishing to business is Rust 490's mantra. And four points are core to the ways I help ideas evolve to flourish. One, all ideas start with an unorthodox creativity, a disruptive spark, and I love working with you how to map that unorthodoxy, take it into the dynamics of the mainstream, yet retain that spark. Two, direct often challenging conversations are essential when working with me. Conversations are the engine of collaboration and partnering for ideas to evolve and flow. Three, a core principle in method is applying customer-focused design principles. Combined with ideation, a keen eye on the transformative risks and opportunities of technologies and of IP, the role and power of data, always with insights into market risks and seeking partnering or collaborative opportunities. Four, this process relies on rapid qualifying in-out morphing of an idea or a concept, followed by equally rapid mapping of a business model and a plan, revisited iteratively to test and hone, mapping a go-to-market strategy and finding an MVP. So that's what I offer as an advisor for ideas to flourish to business. One more observation about the NT Innovation Ecosystem story that's brought us to now, to the Business Innovation Program 3 emerging from that journey. The largest gap in the ecosystem has always been support for people with creative, disruptive ideas on the ground, grassroots people spread out across the territory in our towns and communities at the beginning steps of the innovation journey. Run an Ideas First hackathon or Techstars or GovHack or work with people dropping in to a co-work space and there's nowhere to go next no pathways for people with qualified in lean canvas concepts, customer validated, to go next for expert help in applying the necessary analytical methods with rigor. No financed mechanisms to help early stage ideation. But now there's BIP3, designed with you, the ideas person at the centre. It's a start. You no longer have to move to Queensland or Melbourne to find people equally as passionate or mad as you about building different innovative businesses from a big idea. These people have now come to you. Advisors, people who know how to start this journey from different points of view under BIP3. So step into the space, accept the invitation, pick up the opportunity to stay with that dream, explore its reality and its steps to flourish. Hit us up, we're here. Thank you. She's, she's, a, she's at next year. 
Um, one that we just did miss before, uh, just to touch on, was um, Impact Innovation as well. Um, so they're a group that uh, is a specialist Australian consultancy with operations across the, na uh, the nation and Asia Pacific region, helping private and public sector enterprises navigating the complexities of innovation and commercialization. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, River City Labs, uh, commercial spin-off from Australian Computer Society, one of the number of city labs um, around Australia. Uh, this one's based out of Brisbane. Um, they provide resources to empower, support and connect tech entrepreneurs, startups and scale-up businesses. Uh, the next one is uh, DNA Innovation with a star, so that means we've got a video. That's it. This is our last video because then we're going to jump through to some questions soon. Hello, my name's Doug Adamson. I've had the privilege of being a Northern Territory Government Innovator in Residence for the first version of the Business Innovation Program. And I've really enjoyed working with lots of startups and early stage growth companies to help guide them on their way. I was also a reviewer on the Busy Program previously, and I'm also a growth expert on the Business Acceleration Program. I've been working with companies in the Northern Territory for about eight or nine years. Companies like Speed3D, like Airtip and Alice Springs, uh, like uh, Universal Site Monitoring, like uh, uh, Sterling NT, uh, and like Monsoon Aquatics, along with all the other many companies that have gone through various stages of the programs there. I'm really lucky to be able to say I've had a portfolio career. I've started, grown and built many companies, both in Australia and in Europe and in the UK. Um, <clears throat> I've also been an angel investor uh, and I'm also a general partner in a very small venture capital fund. I had about 10 years experience as a commercialisation advisor on the Commonwealth Government's Accelerating Commercialisation Program. And I love working with startups and fast growth businesses because I really enjoy working and, and hearing their ideas uh, and helping their ideas come to fruition. I'm really excited about the Business Innovation Program 2.0 because it's a refreshed program uh, and it offers some great opportunities. I look forward to working with some of you soon. I think that's a really good point, Danielle, yeah. that, that diversity across the, the types of advisors. If there's something that's not there, right there for you, you know, um, I'm sure, you know, have, have, do your homework, find, I'm sure there's someone there for you. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is. There's great diversity, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess uh, we've we've got in the list here as well, coming up next, um, there's still an assessment process um, to join the pre-approved list as well. Um, so if you know of anyone, if we jump over to the next slide, Martin. <laughs> so we've got a few on the list there as well. Um, but uh, as Martin said before, there's a few rounds. Um, so if you know of anyone who would fit into the advisors list as well, get them to get in touch as well. Um, so we can expand the ecosystem even further for the for BIP3. Because that's what we're thinking already, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. And I guess if you take busy as, as the... As the first as one. As the first yeah, one, we are that's up a fair, to, to that's a, a third version. Assumption. So it's a fair call. And uh, Jude's actually been around for long enough to, to remember that one. Yeah. So um, expectations on the advisors. You as founders need to be getting into relationships with these people. Um, we're funding you to be able to do that or supporting you in, in, in subsidising you to do that. So the things that we expect from our advisors is they generally act in your act generally in the best interest, act at all times in the best interests of, of the clients until all funding has been acquitted and, and hopefully it's been a good relationship and, and, and through on through, uh, past that as well. Um, provide clients with all the things that they've said that they're going to provide you with. So these are things that if you don't get, we'd like to hear back from you. Um, we'd like them to notify us if, if they become aware of any conflict of interest or uh, problem, financial or otherwise, within three business days of it happening. Um, we've asked them to only accept clients that they believe can succeed and commercialise their innovation, which means that on occasion they might not take you on board. They might not believe in you. 
Um, and that's fine because that's something that we've specifically asked them to do. So don't get too uptight if you're talking to an advisor and they go, no, nope, you're not for me, sorry. But we have asked them to provide that feedback to you as to how you could improve your concept so that you can make a better application the next time around. And then, of course, only accept a client that is not a relative or related um, or they have a conflict of interest with. So that's just standard normal business terms. And they'll also be able to give you that kind of advice um, in stage one and stage two leading up to it as well. So we were talking about before, um, you know, it's going to be effective, um, resourceful, innovative. There was a, a bunch of fabulous words in there. Um, so being able to give you feedback on putting you in the right direction for those as well. So if you're not quite reaching one of those four or five goals, that they can point you in the right direction for that. and. Um, send you back to the ecosystem as well because that is a resource that's a fantastic thing to to utilize in this time and for you as as the startups as the participants in the in the uh, in the program if there's uh, a higher cost for the advisor that you want to go with above that two thousand dollars that will provide you then that's up to you to put your hand in your pocket or find that funding from somewhere else um, similarly if they are charging you more than forty percent of the whatever the grant funding that you get in, in stage two, you're gonna to have to make up that difference yourself. So that may be something you wanna consider when, when you're selecting your advisor. Um, the, the price lists are there on, on each of their tiles. Uh, back in the resources section, click on business innovation advisor. Um, and notify us at any time. Um, if you're having any issues um, with your project or your advisor, we can't help if we don't know. So, um, it was a lot of information to take in, so just 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 take a moment now, um, take a breath. You can shake your head and kind of move the thoughts around. Um, but yes, if you do have any immediate questions um, that you'd like answered, um, and you think would be valuable for everyone else to hear, by all means, you know, you can go classic classroom, pop your hand up, and we'll uh, we'll take your questions as well. Doesn't doesn't have to be valuable to anybody else as long <laughs> as it's important to you. Let's um, love 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 to hear it. There we go. We made it so clear that, that everyone's absolutely sold on the program and they've got no questions at all. Best PowerPoint presentation <laughs> ever. Uh, no, we do also have the networking event coming up. Um, so if you do have any questions that you can come and chat independently as well. Do we have any on online, Carmel? No, no that's, that's... Oh. Fantastic. Jason. We'll take a question. Yeah, so, um, uh, identify yourself and provide some identity. <laughs> yeah, I sure do. You don't have the microphone, Martin. No one can hear the joke. Oh, <laughs> the joke is that Jason's developed an identity management platform where you've always got your identification on you at all times, including your qualifications and all this sort of thing, because oftentimes people find themselves caught out, particularly the demographic that Jason's working with, where they're asked to prove things about themselves, which can be quite difficult if it's kept in a paper format back in wherever you've come from. So then when I handed Jason the, the very funny thing that I did was asked him to provide some identification, please, sir. Um, he laughed. He thought it was very amusing. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jason, your question. Yeah, so my question is, um, yeah, I know I'm trying to remember it now. <laughs> Jeez. Um, buy local. That's what it is. So, yeah, buy local. Are, are you able to look outside of the territory as well with the, you know, expenditure of the funds or are you mandated or obligated to buy local? That's a really brilliant, brilliant question. Thank you, Jason. And we do encourage uh, the expenditure of territory government funding on, on, on buying local wherever possible. However, it's not always possible. Um, and there might be a number of reasons for that. But don't forget that criteria, that key criteria, assuming you're desirable, feasible, viable, investable, sustainable, what are we looking for? That value for the territory. So are you going to be able to do it in your development phase? We don't know. But bottom line is, if you can demonstrate that MV, that, that um, uh, value for territory, VFT, um, going forward, then that's probably more important to us than particularly where you, you know, might be sourcing the, the, the supplies or, or um, et cetera for your MVP. That said, we're going to consider it as well. If, if you go, oh, well, I'm going to get this done in the Philippines, you could have got it done in Smith Street, then we're going to be looking at that and, and trying to figure out why. Yeah, fantastic. 
do you have any identification on you? Do you, want to, do you <laughs> might want to speak to Jason. He's got a solution. Uh, it's really going on from there. So uh, last year I did go through to the stage one and um, because I had outsourced, because um, there wasn't anyone in the territory to do what I wanted to do, um, I've done the development myself and I'm here to really kick off with stage two. Um, how do I, I don't know, really know where to start. Like, do I, uh, do I miss out on stage one or go to stage two? Or do like, I don't really yeah, know where I'm at. <laughs> yep. So you're at the same stage as everybody, which is needing to get into stage one. There's a reason for that in that we need to, um, it's a competitive process for that stage two funding, which means we need to put each of the applicants onto a level playing field. If we had more money, um, and by that I mean if, you know, like Elon Musk sort of money, we could do things differently. But with the sort of money we do have available for us and, you know, there's 16 programs under the strategy that we're pushing through. So it's it's got to be competitive. We can fund five per round. And so that means that we really need you to be coming in with that sort of standard uh, template, which is the project plan and the pitch deck for us to work on to figure out which of those five deliver the best value for the territory. Um, if you, and you need you need that uh, advisor on board. If if you're a if you're if you're a sophisticated innovator, and you don't need a stage one advisor, you don't want someone else getting into your business. Bit two point oh might not be that program for you. And we talked about that that there's you know different solutions. In which case maybe you're up to a you know business growth um, uh, funding or, or business pivot grant or something else. And we can talk to you about that or get a small business champion to talk to you. So it's going to be on an individual case by case basis whether this works for you or not. Um, but hopefully, you know, there's a, there's an advisor there and these people have got, you know, a lot of experience in getting ideation through to commercialization. And so I'd be surprised, you know, if it's $2,000 a subsidy, um, that, that for that sort of money, there's not value that a, that an advisor could potentially provide you, um, even to look back at your pitch deck and, and think about how, you know, that further development of MVP can can be tightened up and, and 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 nailed down quicker than otherwise, but if it's not, it's not. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Right. yeah. Great. My turn. <laughs> Hi. Um, I missed the beginning. Sorry. So you may have already mentioned this, but do you need to have a minimum turnover, an ABA, and anything to apply for stage one? You need to be a territory entity. You do not need any turnover. You could be um, first day startup. So you need a good idea, and you need yeah, you need to be a territory entity, which includes an ABN and a permanent residency here or, or presence here in the territory. So, any more questions? Fantastic. All right, that was relatively, not even relative, that was solid. That was, that was fantastic. And we're, we're at 6.30, so we've got half an hour of networking. How exciting. Well, that's very exciting. That's, Thank I, you. I love networking. I love it. I'm excited. And it means that you and I get to go off the microphone. So can we please have a big round of applause for Martin Redhead? Well, mm -hmm. hold that applause. Hold that applause. Because I don't, I don't deserve... Um, to have you applaud me because you need to be applauding my team, which if I could just uh, point out up the back, um, who I would invite up the front if I had any hope of getting her to do so is Carmel. Carmel Carmel's been a big part of putting uh, BIP 2.0 together. Um, she's been with the team about 12 months. She was integral in reviewing and evaluating BIP 1.0. She's been integral in developing up the the way that BIP 2.0 works and the processes for it, in engaging with the the uh, advisors, in in working through the due diligence and the assessment of those applications, etc. So we wouldn't be here tonight without without Carmel and the hard work that she's put in. On top of that, which is a day job. Um, She's been a tower of strength through the end of financial year uh, joys that I'm sure we all experience. We experience especially um, uh, in, in government as we try to reconcile our books with Treasury going in. And so Carmel's put um, her hand up uh, doubly on top of that. So um, to, to, to help deliver this, 
tonight to be a driving force in delivering this tonight, plus the other stuff that she's taken on over the last couple of months. I just want to give her a round of applause, please. <laughs> Secondly, I want to thank Trish, who's come on just today to help out the team. So thank you, Trish. Very grateful. Place looks wonderful. It's um, brilliant bit of asset management. And I'd like to introduce Shandala. Shandala, can you, can you come up or wave or whatever from up the back? Shandala's the new... Um, uh, I was just trying to think. It's it's it it is. It's the manager of of the unit that we work in, and so she's our our team leader, and she's our science lead, um, which is another one of the priorities of 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 the strategy. So I'd like you to join me in welcoming Shandown onto the team. And now I'll stop talking. Um, we would like to thank you all for being here as well and online. Um, you're all free to go and have tea or coffee or dinner or whatever it is you're having. Um, but for everyone in the room, yes, we do have um, up until so 25 minutes of networking. Go and grab yourself a drink, get yourself some food, chat amongst yourselves and um, yeah, in, enjoy, the, enjoy the official launch of BIP 2.0. Thank you so much for joining us today.